Absolutely perfect. <laughs> Go. Right. So, what do you want? Uh, as they say, I don't, like, I, I don't know. I'm a bit random when I do these. I quite like this to see what happens. Um, now, I was going to send me questions. I'll send you some questions to ask. And I haven't had any. Maybe you said I've lost them. So, I'm just quite happy to, um, you know, maybe we just have 20 minutes chatting and just finding out a bit more about where you are. And, yeah, you know, sure. Absolutely. That's I fine. Love the, the, I love the logs yesterday. A lovely what? I loved the logs picture that you shared. Oh yeah, right. Oh well, things have happened there because I mean, most of the, virtually the whole of the stack on the right hand side has now been moved into the house, uh, so that so they can dry, uh, and well, not dry, they're dry already, but you know they can they can te they can temperate this all uh, because I needed some exercise and because it's easier if you bring them all in, all in then you don't have to go scurrying out every. Mm -hmm. So you have to load the thing up. They're actually this, they're stored beside the fire. So whereabouts are you? Tell anybody where you are. Well, if you imagine your O-level geography and think of Scandinavia and have a rough idea of where Stockholm is, it's sort of on the right on the Scandinavian peninsula at the bump and Oslo, which is towards the left. Uh, I'm halfway in between those two. You haven't right. done a, have you been on, have you done a video before on YouTube or anything like that? No. So you haven't had like your story shared or your no captured. No, nobody asked me questions like this. I just sort of I feed the horses and bring the wood in and. So how long have you been over up. there? What? How long have you been in Sweden for? I came to Sweden in 1970. And the reason I came to Sweden in 1970 was because I was pissed off with England. I was like, ah, this isn't getting me anywhere. I want to get out of here. So um, I was, uh, I, I, I had, a, I had a, when I was, when I, blah, 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 blah. Um, a friend of mine said to me, you've got the gift of the gab, you should go into sales. And it was like, okay, I'll try that. So I got a job in sales. And uh, by the time we get to um, uh, April, May, uh, 1970, that job is sort of running out and getting boring and I want to get out. And I think I also regarded the UK as an extremely old boy network oriented. Um, and it wasn't who, what you could do, what you, who you knew. So I basically looked for any job that would take me outside the UK, which was under the heading of selling. And I got interviewed and they said, yes, we'll have you. And at three days notice, they said, you're going to Stockholm. It was like, okay. Um, I didn't know what I was going to be doing. I on the, flew in on the Sunday, August the 30th, 1970. And the next day I started learning how to sell carbon paper, knocking on doors, business to business. It's a bit like vacuum cleaning. Vac the principle was the same as vacuum cleaners. In other words, you don't go unless you've been thrown out or you get an order. Uh, when awesome. you do door knocking, when you kind of go cold yeah. calling, I think it gives you a lot of confidence to do anything after that. <laughs> It, it's it's a great training. As I said, you know, I run across a lot of people who of my age who did do the the uh, the vacuum cleaner stuff. Not so many people who did carbon paper, um, but but you know, and it and it does it does set you up, or you you fail and you realise it's not quite my thing. I mean, I did. There was quite a high um, turnover of, of incoming staff. You know, we we brought them in and we trained we trained them for a couple of weeks, and you know, there was a there was a bonus. It's like if you stayed um it was all on commission so the first two weeks when you're training you didn't get any money so that was like a debt you owed to the company already but if you stayed i think six weeks and then you got uh, got your debt written off for two months but there was a there were a lot of guys who came in despite a fairly good um interview process um there were a lot of guys who, who just didn't make it they got homesick or they just you know they didn't couldn't stand being told no there's nobody here who's interested in that five times mm -hmm. a day I know. Um, a lot yeah. of uh, personal development, isn't there? <laughs> there is a lot of personal development in it. It's like, and not feeling I'm a bad person because I haven't sold anything this month. But I mean, mm. it wasn't until probably about well, five, maybe 10 years ago that I didn't from time to time have dreams about it's Wednesday yeah. evening. I haven't sold anything all week. The boss is going to be ringing this evening to check out how it's going. And I'm feeling like I'm worthless. Mm. Um, it was at this period of my life when I was literally knocking on doors. It wasn't that glamorous. It was quite often 
industrial estates in a town with a population of 15,000, you know, we're talking about really small places, we try to cover everything. Um, somewhere, you know, anywhere we could con somebody into putting the name on a bit of paper. Um, I found there was a wonderful institution called the Swedish Cafe. And at this wonderful institution called the Swedish Cafe, they had wonderful coffee. England coffee, 1970s, not good. We, you know, we haven't even heard about the concept of barista and coffee was, mm, but Swedish coffee was great. And they also had this wonderful invention called, a, what, what it, the Brits know as a Danish pastry. And so I would, you know, despite the fact that it was cold and it was snowing and I was miserable and I hadn't sold anything, I would manage to get into a, get into a, a Swedish coffee house and have a, a, a coffee and you could refill and you got refills. Refills were part of the deal. You paid for your coffee and you could have two or three refills and also um, enjoy a Danish. Um, yeah, it was tough. It, it, was, it, was, it was enjoyable. It was personal development. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, so that was 1970 and I carried on doing that for three or four years. And then I started sort of doing something on the side. Uh, it, it was not just carbon paper, we got into other stuff. And one of the other stuff took, got me on the side. And then from about 77 through to early 90s, um, no, early 80s, sorry. Um, I was, we were doing um, um, original work. In other words, we were preparing stuff so that a printer could take it over and, and make 2000 copies of it. We were putting together putting together rough ideas from a customer who came in with a, you know, a couple of pictures and some very bad text uh, and turning that into something which was, was uh, mm. suitable for processing by printer. And then I went into um, impresario work, uh, finding um, foreign artists and bringing them into Sweden to, um, to perform or to run workshops, which is very much personal development, that sort of theater. This wasn't you know, Shakespeare, this was experimental theater. Mm. Um, and then I got into the bouncy castle business and developed the Sweden's largest um, uh, rental stable of bouncy castle. Uh, and that um, made that that grew in, grew in the bacon until I think about '93 when it was beginning to begin to get a bit thin. And then I went in. Then I went into the 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 adult training business again, absolutely by accident, not by intention. Uh, somebody would heard uh long chain network chain somebody heard that somebody's husband was an englishman they may have been living in the right place when somebody needed a, somebody who could teach something because somebody else sold too many english language courses uh so i started teaching english um, not because i could do it but because it was like we needed the money and i actually found i could do it because tra training adult swedes to speak english is not really about grammar and vocabulary they get that because Swedish TV, like all these small countries, they don't dub, they subtext. So ki Swedish kids actually quite often, even at that time in the 70s, in the 80s, they, they had quite good English because they'd been dumped in, down in front of children's channel at the age of you know, three months and picked it up. They were just hearing things and then they would, they would, uh, they would uh, parrot it. Um, the problem with Swedes and English is that when they got to school, there was some um, person there in the role of a teacher who would say basically if you can't tell the difference between who and which then you should keep your mouth shut so they were very frightened of making mistakes and so my, my, uh, I did know quite a lot about personal development by this time and so I, I used what I knew about personal development and um, creating safe spaces and and not worrying too much about making a mistake nobody's going to die um, on the English language or, or people in, in First and foremost, it was the steelworks, people there who wanted to, to be able to use English to do their work for the increasing number of foreign customers. Uh, and, and I was at the steelworks for eight, seven or eight years, and, and I started getting sort of, you know, I got the basic groups, which was paying the mortgage and the food, and, and then people would come along and say, um, could you do some one-to-one -one work with Harry? And it was like, yeah, sure, why does Harry need English? Well, we're thinking of sending him off on a course sometime or other, and he's just had a divorce. So it was sort of recognized that I wasn't just doing English, that I was having some sort of effect on people, which seemed to be quite calming. So Harry, newly divorced, totally alone in the world, no network, wondering what the hell had hit him. Uh, we would sit down and do English, and I would listen to him and say, how's life, Harry? You know, My job is to help you to do your job. You know, talk about yourself. I got paid for doing it. I still do. You know, I get paid for listening to people tell their stories, rather like yourself. 
Uh, and that's pretty much the way it's been. I, you, I say sometimes, I came into this country selling people carbon paper. Nowadays, I sell people the idea that they are something. It's this very much the same skill set. I, I usually say, in, you know, I've done sales, I've done um, coaching, still do coaching, I've done facilitation, I've done acting, I've sort of covered, done a cover job for a priest, um, what's the other one, I'm sort of verging on therapy. It's all the same skill set. Okay. And it, there, there I rest my peace, my Lord. Um, yes. Great. Perfect. Um, Certainly. I've been thinking about what we're doing together, um, you know, in, in preparation for this call and the fact that, that Neil's got, got me lined up for something tomorrow. Um, and part of the preparation was a call I did, uh, I took part in a 40 man, two hour uh, session uh, where we were 40 guys, usually in, in breakout groups of, of uh, five or six looking at, you know, what have I done in 2020 and what am I looking forward to in 2021? Mm. Um, and, and these are, you know, these are guys who, who have been through a particular school and whether it's a high level, level of trust, we're not just talking about people who come up the street. And they're all, they're all over 50s. This was the, the, the organization's elders. And, and that set me thinking about this interesting concept of safe spaces and um, how much um people can allow themselves to be really honest in what is called a safe spaces in other words a place in which they feel that they will not be judged i would mm -hmm. say is pretty central in that um and, and, and i've always found it really interesting to like the, the concept of accelerated learning or yeah. accelerated development in other words you know how can you take a process which is supposed to take three months according to the consultants and bring it down to three days or at least three weeks um yeah so it's 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 and it's very much about creating a safe space and i'm not sure and i don't like the expression creating a safe space i don't think i create safe spaces what i do think i do is to sitting with a group of people they've never met before i can facilitate them experiencing or allowing their the, the bit of them that does feel safe to take more space of the bit of them that feels threatened mm. I, 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 I'm, 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 a, I'm heavily anti-hierarchical. I'm heavily anti, you know, somebody who says to me, no, I'm going to create a safe space for you. It's like, well, I'm leaving. Because if you, if you think you're in charge of my safe space, yeah. I don't want to be in this room. Mm. I don't think you're safe because you think you own it. And if I start getting very safe, uh, and this is, some, this is something that does turn up in, in, I hear from people who work for therapy, so if, I'm getting, if I'm feeling very safe, I might start talking about things that you don't feel safe with, and then you're going to shut me down. I don't want to be shut down. And I know that it, I know this happens in the therapeutic world. Um, you know, the client, will say to the, to, the client will say to the therapist, okay, I had this dream last night about that. And the therapist will probably say something like, do you really think you're ready to talk about this? Which means I'm not ready to talk about this. Hmm. A couple of ladies I know who uh, who are, are incest children, um, women that have been very close friends of mine, um, have both experienced this. And, and the client, you know, their, their, their therapist was definitely not happy about hmm. going. Okay. Presumably having unexplored issues related to childhood abuse. Hmm. Yeah. So it's facilitating a safe space, so that. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, and 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 I think that you know, facilitating a safe space, and it's like, well, it's going to be. A, yeah, I can't make it safer for you than you're going to want it to be for yourself, and it's perfectly okay for the room to be variations in the room, mm -hmm. and some people, you know, it won't happen, and some people because they are, you know, because they are not prepared to take that risk. Uh, for some reason or other, which I will not argue with. I'm just, you know, I might say, could you reconsider the judgment you have about this, which is, which is telling you that this is not a good place to talk about. Every time I see my boss, I'm reminded of a school teacher who beat me up 40 years ago. 
and and it's okay you can you can make that choice but you know might be so that it might be helpful in your career to make the sort of choices that we're asking we're going to be asking people to make which like which is which is about connections about identifying things we've, we've, we've talked a lot about projections and what is a projection um it's the decision to interpret a signal in one way or another it's cup half full cup half empty um Human beings are, the brain seems to be geared up to, you, know, you get a signal and then you decide what to do with it. And, and you know, 50% of, oh, a lot of the time it's perfectly okay. There's a bus going past at 60 miles an hour. I do not step into the road. That's good. That's fear. Yeah? Fear keeps mm -hmm. us safe. But if I, um, if I see, I don't know, if Ingrid asks me a question which I don't know the answer to, I can go into fear. I've got to find an answer. Otherwise, she's going to throw me out and I'm going to be living under a bridge for the rest of my life. Or I can sit there and I can say, I don't know. Because mm -hmm. the chance that she's going to throw me out and I'm going to be living under a bridge for the rest of my life mm -hmm. is pretty minimal. It's funny that goes through here. But, but but I can I I mean I've been doing this stuff for thirty years now and I'm still you know I'm st I can still get blindsided and go into why are you asking me that question? Mm. That's not relevant. I don't believe we could do that. Mm. 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 I still still um, what are it um, knee jerk reactions um, on areas which I'm you know which I'm not entirely safe about in my own mind. Security is a big issue for me, um, which perhaps is why I've been working with it a lot uh, in the last 30 years. -ish. Mm -hmm. um, so who, how, if, if you needed support or what you do to others, how do you get supported? Well, the things like we did yesterday, you know, 40 guys, and as I said, most of the time, we were two hour session, most of the time it was, it was a breakout room with, with five men, of whom one, two I know in one way or another from previous sessions, similar sessions. Um, that, that's, that's where, I mean, I have, there's a, there's a group that I'm part of, which meets on Wednesday evenings and has been meeting not with the same people all the time, but it's, that's been going on since 2011. Now, this is a two-hour session. We all know the structure. We all know why we're there. It is an escape valve. And it can be an escape valve because, like, I'm frightened and I'm going to lose my job. And my fear is, is seeping out all over my family. Mm. Or I'm going to be frightened I'm going to be losing my marriage. And my fear is seeping out all over my job. Um, you know, buttons are getting pressed. Um, ration, and, 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 and rational, rational behavior um, needs, can be exposed. Oh, irrational, apparently irrational behavior can be exposed to the hopefully rational thoughts of the other people in the room who have a little bit more distance to it and who know each other. Um, yeah, that's basically, so that's, that's where I get my support. Okay, and the reason we've um, kind of sharing out this video is uh, we're having conversations and getting some clarity and direction around what we're going to be creating with Niall. And um, so we're kind of still working our way through how we're going to work together mm. and what it is. So it's kind of just a, a work, we're, we're, well, that's a work in progress. We're a work in progress. Absolutely. And you're speaking tomorrow at Niall's event about um, a bit more about it. And that's yep. on that's that. What's he calling that event? Do you know, do you know what it's called? We should know. Something peer, something peer. Peer to peer space. I get it wrong because I could actually. It's one, it's one of his peer events. Um, his hang on, I've actually, I've actually just got a message from him. I've just posted this on peer space or whatever uh, mixer session. Brilliant. And I think I... sixteen hundred UK tomorrow. That's that's what what I will be doing. Brilliant. And I think we'll catch that tomorrow. We'll probably that'll give the um, flavor of what we're. And he has said Mike will be talking about fear, mission, and his work keeping people on track. And there should be time to pick his brain a little before we close. Okay, so that's what I'm supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Now I know. That's what you're okay. talking about. I, I, can, I can live. I, I've got my marching orders and I can I can live up to that. So there you go. So I'll I'll um edit what we've kind of 
said today. Is there anything in, in here that you don't want me to share out? Is there anything you said? Did you say you said about your friends at one point the internet, who had difficulties over sharing in a script? Nothing there that you said that wouldn't. I didn't know. I mean, no, I mean, there's, there's nobody, there's nobody named here. I'll probably just leave it as it is, to be honest, because it's not, I think it's more of just kind of um, something that I'll just share and say, getting to know, getting to know Mike. But I'm, I'm really fascinated in, in, in where you are, because I mean, I'm, um, I'm absolutely, I mean, so what has happened? 28th of December, Neil and I are, are hanging out and sort of, I'm yelling at him actually, I think, well, something else, he needs it. Um, it does him good. Um, it hurts him more than it hurts me. Oh no, it hurts me more than it hurts me, et cetera. Um, and, and somewhere in this, as I sort of chuck in, I'm like, oh, there's the idea I have of doing something about um, New Year's resolutions and actually making them stick rather than letting them fall into the sand, you know, after about three weeks. And, and, and in a way, what we're doing now is, is a development from the, the, that, for me, a bit of the beginning of the string. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, and, and I said, you know, this has got nothing to do with the work that he and I do within a, a, a men's organization, particular men's organization. And, you know, it's going to have to be for, for anybody, including, including women. And, and so he immediately said, um, so we could bring Jane in. And it was like, yes, of course we can bring Jane in. Um, but I'm aware of the fact, or at least in my mind is saying, you're not quite used to the environment that, that Neil and I are working in, in the men's work, because, which is very, has a very particular structure. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a rather a, a, a supportive, but yeah, a supportive structure, but it is specific. Um, I see you coming up with some very imaginative and very bright and very intuitive and very relevant ideas all the time, which I'm thoroughly enjoying mm -hmm. because I don't know you as well as I, I know Niall. I know I know Niall now. I've known him over a year, pretty intense. So, so you know, he's he's developing, but this, it's not so much new. You, I don't know in the same way. Mm. So, where, so I'm not really quite interested on where you see what we will be starting on provisionally in the ninth of March. Where, where you know, how you see that? Yeah. Well, I like to think of myself as a managing moments coach. If I was going to think of myself in and label myself out there or a creative consultant. Um, and I, when I think of the managing moments side of things, I often think, well, we, we're not quite sure of the direction right now. And that's where I like to be at. I like to be kind of working in the moment with people and intuitively, like all of those things you've just said, because um, life doesn't happen linearly. <laughs> and what we're doing isn't happening linearly. And we don't even know what it, what it could be yet. But I think the more we're kind of practicing and sharing and talking, getting to know each other, then we'll create something solid from it. So. For me, I love working creatively. This is where I am in my flow, working with you guys like, like this, just working in, in a really safe, I feel safe to, to, to play. And it has an impact in other stuff I'm doing. Yeah. Um, I've got clear, I've got clear on my resilient kids movement. I've been very focused on that recently, very much more. That's just a movement. That's my passion project. And where I'm focused on that, I can be very um it's clear who the audience is. It's for eight to 10 year olds, it's for kids. It's also to support parents if they want support. And, and now I've got into that flow with that. I feel like I can just tweet, share, talk to people. I'm doing blogs, I'm doing interviews with people on that platform. So I think it fit, fuel, this kind of environment, this kind of relationship fuels my other stuff. Sure. So I don't feel alone, you know, because I, I, I'm obviously out there doing stuff and feeling quite passionate about that mm -hmm. um, side of things. So yeah, and I, I'll probably- bring I, I really like and I'll bring in that creativity to, to what we're doing and encourage people to be creative and playful and have fun. And, and in fact, the kid stuff I found, I'm going more along the route of, actually I work, I've been saying I've, in my portfolio, I work with people who are fun. And, and I collaborate and create with people who are fun from now on. And I put on my kids stuff, I, I enjoy emotional, you know, teaching around, in, 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 my speciality is emotional, in, emotional intelligence and, and being playful and fun and I thought because kids there's a lot of stuff out there about therapy for kids and counseling for kids like we've just touched on and actually the reason they're needing more of this is because of the, of the creativity and fun and play was taken out of the curriculum and the teachers who are kind of a bit playful like me have got, kind of, have got tick boxes so I think and actually my model of play and fun is, is very needed and that's what I need to that's what I'm going to focus on if you get me, get me. <laughs>
it's it i i do get you and, and and you remind me of something which has sort of been kicking around in my mind i was like i was fortunate and the company that first asked me you know can you be a teacher well it wasn't the first but it was like they gave me a job um but that was about 1993 and, and this was a company which which had it's no longer exists it went bankrupt it was a swedish government department it wasn't used to actually being asked to be accountable for what it was spending uh, it spent far too much money and it 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 got subjected to um, commercial um, competition and died. Okay, but while I was in there, they were still spending lots of money, amongst other things, on staff training. And we had some wonderful trainers. We were doing week-long stuff with really international trainers in this sort of back end of Sweden, part mm -hmm. of the country. Uh, and one of them there, I still have a book up here. Um, <laughs> I love your the, Yes, the learning, the the learning, the learning revolution. Yes. From, from the night yes. yes and 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 we and we had i think it was a three or maybe five day uh, seminar with the the lady who wrote that who's a really interesting person um and one of the phrases which really sticks in my mind from that time was this was it was and this is a, she's talking about adult learning right and she said you know if they're not laughing they're not learning and no. um, you know and, and you can break that down into good uh, neurological stuff you know if you you if you if you if you haven't got past the reptilian and the mammalian brain then learning in the human senses is is, is not going to happen because those two have got to be happy so you've got to be safe and you've got to be well fed and warm and probably huddling together with another group of people um brilliant woman really interesting what the reason she got into to to, to pedagogics was from her own experience which was i think at the end of the she's a bit older than i am and at the end of the war, her family, she was seven, and her family moved her from Holland, uh, which was pretty wiped out at the end of the war, and they managed to get across to America. So at the age of seven, she ended up in a totally um, uh, unfamiliar environment, not understanding anything that was going on around her. I have to look her up. She, Do, you know, um, Do you know her? Um, got the book, and her name is Jeanette Voss. Okay, hold on. V O S. Let's take a shot of that. Actually, have you got the book there? Let's take a like that. Yeah, let's, let's have a look. Hold it down a little bit. That's the picture. That's what I'll show my kids stuff. Yeah. Oh, here we go. There you go. There you go. I'll go back a bit. I can see you. Get yourself in it a bit as well, because I can't see you now. It'd be nice to have you in the shot. Well, wow. okay, <laughs> love it. <laughs> yes. And um, um, and that and that and I don't know if it's still in print, but it was it had been heavily reprinted, and there's some really brilliant stuff in there. Uh, and I still got all the notes. I oh, used, well, maybe I, I taught from it. Well, maybe there's some some nudges there for what we're doing in there. Maybe there's. Well, the interesting thing, the reason I brought that up was that it has occurred to me, and I did a lot. You know, I've done a lot with 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 it. I've never done the school work. Uh, no, I've never done any school work as in kids, normal schools. I've been out and visited them more, more recently when we were doing men's, talking about men's work and masculinity and all that stuff. And then I've been in schools. But most of my work's been done with adults in industry, okay? Yeah. And that's a very efficient industry because your, your customer is a, a, a boss in a company who is responsible for producing something. His staff, who you are dealing with as, 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 as the teach, um, actually represent an income source for him. So basically, oh yeah, there was a conversation I had with a guy who said, I was going to, and we said, we, we put in this proposal, we we're going to do an offsite for 20 people for two days um, related to teaching them to actually fill in their time forms so that the, the boss could invoice for something. And I said, okay, so this is the thing we're doing. Um, our contact person, you know, who's in, who is in charge of these 20 people, thinks it's okay. Uh, what do you think? And he came back after an afternoon and he said, it's like, it's fucking expensive. And I said, well, I'm, I'm not charging very much. And it's not you, it's not your cost of the problem. You're taking 20 of my staff for two days, right? 40 day people. Um, each one of them is invoiceable for about 800 quid a day. Can you do it quicker? And the answer was yes, because we, you know, I had all these tools of accelerated learning. 
Now, my observation is that a lot of the stuff that has been done in adult education, which, which I've had the, the, the privilege of learning, seems to have been forgotten in the schools. Mm. And the schools have become very mechanistic. Well, listen, I, I, I don't know so much about it, but I hear both in Sweden and what you're saying in England, you know, there's, there's very little room for anything apart from, from rather standardized learning. And, and, you know, we in the, uh, the, so the adult education area was, 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 it was very much into, you have to deal with the fact you've got 20 kids, if you've got 20 students in the room, then there's going to be a wide range of teaching uh, style needs. And I know the teaching style thing has, has become under criticism, mm -hmm. but I still think there is a germ of truth in there. Some people like to read on their own. Some people like going to lectures. I cannot understand that, but it works for them. Yes, I can only learn things if I've got a bunch of people I can learn with, which is why you and Nile and I are doing something which is fairly new. And it's like, I'm going to learn quite often. What so you're much. saying is like, it's, it's very much what Voss is saying in that book and was saying there back in whenever it was, 1992. Uh, and the schools seem to have lost contact with it for some weird reason. But, but business, which measures, th which is business is quite good at measuring things. Uh, even quite long term, they're quite good. At, you know, they're, they're used to investing, particularly the industries I was involved with, heavy industry. You know, you somebody I know towards the end of that period, somebody managed to get a printing. Uh, they managed to get Stora Enso, a big uh, paper mill company, international paper mill. They managed to get the international board to invest in a new paper machine um, up in this town, close to the steel mill where I work. And everybody knew that, that investment means that there are going to be jobs in that town for the next 30 to 40 years. In other words, the big industries are used to working with big long time frames, and they even do that actually as far as staff development is concerned. Mm. I sometimes feel, wonder how good the school children environment is good, is at measuring its, its effectivity. Mm. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I don't you know, don't know sometimes the, the impact you have on somebody, a child at the yeah. age of six or seven, you can't measure that impact, which will have fruition as an adult. And, you know, you can still look at the teachers you had, I had, and who influenced me. And, and actually there was a particular teacher. And uh, I feel like that he was a guiding light from what I do. Um, yeah. I didn't know that. So. I, I think I was quite lucky in that concern because I said, I'm born 48. So, so I have quite a number of teachers who were teaching me, who were the, um, who had gone through a program which existed immediately after the Second World War to getting guys back into the job. So there, there were fairly rapid teacher training programs for men who were coming out of the forces. Right, right. Um, and, and I spit, oh. Woo! Uh, I, <laughs> It's quite emotional. And I particularly remember one, and I remember very much what he looked like, but just the more I can't remember his name. Unbelievably enthusiastic about what he was doing. And there was a certain character about that man. I mean, this is a, an ordinary council school, so there were both ma male and female teachers, perhaps more female than male, but anyway, there was a character to this guy who, who, who wasn't an academic teacher. He hadn't been through the Pucker teacher training school, but he was a wonderful teacher, which was a bit different from the older guys, you know, who are older and tired and perhaps not quite so happy about dealing with 10 year olds who can be a bit of a handful. But um, that man's inspiration, I can still remember some of the whiteboard stuff that he did, and some of the, the, um, the, 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 the illustrative sheets he was doing on history it made an amazing impression. If I, in the meantime, if I get a copy, if I have a look at the book, this, um, The Learning Revolution, see if I can, yeah. and Accelerated Learning, but more about that, I'm sure I know about it, but I don't, if you know what I mean. I... The, the key name in, uh, so, so the Learning Revolution is, is there, have a look at it. I mean, it, it's deeply affected everything I do. You know. mm -hmm. um, the, the Accelerated Learning thing, there's a key name there, which is Colin Rose, okay? Because he, he didn't invent it, but he certainly did a very good job of, of, of packaging and marketing it. Mm. Um, and again, the, you know, so, so accelerated learning is very much around learning styles and learning the learning, which was, who was behind that? Somebody whose name begins with a G and I can't remember it. 
Anyway, um, what? Gardener. Yes, right. And, and the whole of that model over the last five years has been put into doubt. And, and it's like, yeah, like anything, if you take it too far, it's not, it's not the whole truth. You know, it's a bit of the truth. I still do, or at least it worked for me for 20 years. You know, if you could get a hum, you know, what are these, what are these individuals need? When I was doing longer courses then, and actually I think it would be quite useful to do it now. I remember the first time I did a course like the one we're doing now. It was 1997, and I had this great idea of going to put together a business leadership model with a accelerated learning. And I and I went along and I sold it into the to the uh, training officer of the steel mill, 2,800 people, um, and he said, "Yeah, go for it. Great, you combine English, they practice speaking English, and they get a leadership model which is modern and respected." So that was it. Um, but so I, I thought, okay, shit, God, I've got to perform now. And you've seen how it is for me. It's like one thing to come up with an idea. Now you're going to have to produce it. Like, no, who, me? I'm four years old. Um, and, I, and, and in that case, I got 20 applications, and two of them were on the board. So I was really scared out of my mind. Most of them had academic degrees, highly skilled engineers. Some of them I knew, very nice people, um, younger than myself, really nice people. And because I was so terrified of meeting 20 people who I regarded as being superior to me in one fell swoop and having to lead them somewhere. And I actually did then start doing what I believe in, which is I had, a, I said, well, let's have a coffee break and find out what's going on. And I got some absolute gems of why they were doing it. There was one lady whose name I, I still have a little bit of contact with. Um, and, and she came up with this amazing thing. She said, well, I want to do this course because when I was 17, 18, I went off an exchange thing to America uh, and we'll call her Jeanette, okay? But that's my name. And she said, I went on the exchange thing and I was in America for two years and she was now 24, 25. And she said, and I want to reconnect with the American Jeanette. And so she was aware of a bi, uh, what we call it, a bilingual a personality difference, which is not uncommon. Um, really fascinating stuff. She'd already sort of, she, so there was a, there was a, there was an American Jeanette in that environment, 17, young woman, individuating away from the family, subjected to a new culture, and being able to be herself in a way that you can't do in what my beloved ex-wife called the repressive mother tongue there was a the, and this goes back to personal development again Anna, my, my ex-wife used that expression in relation to a lot of the personal development she did but she did it in the uk and she said you know it was so much easier to do it in something other than my repressive mother tongue and i i think that's a that's a valid comment it's not true for everybody but for an awful lot of people moving from one language to another actually can provide them with a freedom and, and, you know, and it can also provide them with a problem because they've had a teacher who said, you know, if you can't tell the difference between who and which, you should never open, open your mouth. You can get past that. You're in an interesting place. Uh, how did we get there? Yeah, that lady who we've chosen to call Jeanette, and I realize I'm just on the verge of using her real name, which I don't want to do. But that course, which was, it went very well. Um, and we actually ran it, I think, four times. Um, Jeanette got pregnant. Um, there's nothing to do with me in the course, but anyway, uh, maybe it was, maybe she got confident. Uh, and, and so she, she, had, and she had the baby and she was, you know, she wasn't working anymore. And she rang up, I think, about when the child was about four or five months old and said, I'm really missing the group, Mike. Would it be possible for me to come back for a couple of sessions? Because it was a very safe place to work in. <sighs> And, and it was because we weren't in the industrial side. We were working actually in a building outside. So it was okay to come. And she brought the child with her. And I, I still remember she came in. Basically, she, she put this kid who is now in her 20s um, in the middle of the room, in the middle of the circle. And she was as quiet as a baby can be. She feels very safe. Yes. Oh, that was, you know, that, that's another lovely moment. But I think there's the business there about finding out about the participants. If you're not, you know, saying, okay, this is a hammer, and I'm going to teach you how to use a hammer, it'll be a three hours course, or 
health and safety around explosive materials. But we're dealing here, we're dealing in my, my mind, says this is, a, this is a change process. Um, helping these people to move from A to B, and they're going to define where B is themselves, it's got nothing to do with me um, or you or, or, or Niall. We don't define it. But hopefully the B they define they want to be at the end of the, cor the course or the program is a B which is a stretch, it's a challenge. And in order to be able to make that challenge as both meaningful and stretchy as they dare, I think we've got to create the safe place in which the child can fall asleep for two hours or three hours. Mm. Um, yeah, so that, that's basically the, 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 the challenge. Why don't I go there? Well, having that conversation at the beginning with the individual means that, that you, you, can, you can get a sense of who they are and you can get a sense of who they are. And you can actually start inviting them to share their own internalized safe space with first, you know, you or me or Niall, whoever interviews them. And then they have some experience of that and they can, it hopefully is easier for them to choose to, to, choose to share their internalized safe space mm. with um, other people and be confronted hopefully with an awful lot of ideas which aren't really I would say the ideas I'm working with, as far as I can say, they're mainstream, but then it's like, when was that lovely phrase from IBM many years ago? It's common sense, but not common practice. And I, 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 uh, the, the, um, and, um, I still feel there's an awful lot of what you and I know as common sense, but it's not always brought in as common practice into people's daily life because mm -hmm. of belief systems, values, am I good enough, all this other quite repressive negative stuff which is around in our societies, uh, including fear. Uh, and I don't think the fear level's got any better uh, as a result of what's been going on for the last uh, nine months, nine, ten months. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of worry frightened people out there. And, and I, for me, the fundamental was what we were talking about this morning is like, it's perfectly okay to have a feeling, but it's not a perfectly okay always to react, mm, have your knee jerk react to that feeling. It may be so that the cup is not half full, but it's half empty, which means it isn't a threat, or it is, depending on the situation. And um, our uh, we, we, we all can, and this, this is, fairly well-founded research now we can you know feelings are there but they're definitely not reliable and you can definitely choose how do you relate to them it's like yes there's a bus but it's 500 meters away mm. in other words what, 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 we're, what we're tuned to do i used to say that my kids could read at the age of about six months and people said, no, that's amazing. How can they do that? It must be wonderful. But they can read an ice cream sign at 500 meters when we're in the car, which is time, they, time enough for them to yell, Daddy's, oh, not to yell, they be six months, ah, two years. It was time enough for them to yell, Daddy, ice cream, stop. So you, you, the, the ice cream sign was a signal, and it meant pleasure and something sweet to eat, and we're bored sitting in the back of the car, Dad. <laughs> now, that the human brain is quite good at that and you know there are road signs it's red we stop the car otherwise you're going to have an accident but sometimes in more more diffuse areas then we see a signal and we interpret it wrongly and it's the business of being able to pick up and it's like so why did i choose to to, to why did i choose to be react from fear when she says she's driving into town you know, why, why do I go, why, where are you going? You know, why, why do I, why do I become a possessive, a possessive partner at times in relation to somebody I lived with and has shown me endless evidence of her love for 16 years, 18 years. God, a long time. Is this a good idea? I don't know. Maybe I'm getting dependent on the relationship. Ooh. Um, so it's, it's a question of being able to, to, to say, I am feeling fear. Okay. And is that fear relevant? Should I be reacting from it, or should I be saying, "Hey, that's an opportunity"? Mm, yeah. How true is it? Yeah, yeah. How true is my right? There's another lovely book up there, which is called um, "The Chimp Paradox." Yes, the Chimp Paradox. 
You know about that? Yes, I have read it. But I've just heard about it. Yeah. Well, it, the, the basic idea, you don't have to read the book, it's quite thick. I mean, if you can, if you want to, but basically his model is as follows. The human um, entity gets signals coming from all over the place, primarily eyes, nose, ears. Yes, primarily those. And again, it's, it basically, it's just the development of the, the, the three level brain thing. And his thing is like, OK, so in the brain, you've got three components. You've got a computer which stores all the information uh, and which you have to get into and get out of. You have a monkey, and you know what monkeys are like. <laughs> Very reactive. And then you have a human being who, on a good day, can be quite rational. And, you know, like on a good day, can. And so, what happens is the infant coming information, which has to be processed by the computer somehow or other, goes to the computer, goes first to the monkey. And the monkey looks at it very quickly, probably misreads it, and goes, Wah! and then gets a reaction from the computer and goes, ah, oh, what? And on a good day, you know, after, I don't know, 60 seconds or 60 hours, the rational human being turns up and says, um, that perhaps wasn't the best thing to do. And, and it's, for me, it's that, 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 that's, that's a lot of what we'll be doing it. And it, within the framework of like, okay, so you set up this thing that you want to do for yourself in one part of your life, which is going to take us about three months. Now, it is challenging, otherwise it wouldn't be interesting. If you want to have an unchallenging one, that's okay, but you'll probably, you know, you'll probably run out of steam after a month and have a new one. That's okay as well. Um, but we're going to be looking at the challenges that come up and the judgments that you make about your own behaviour, and you'll be doing this within the framework of a supportive group of people. And I don't just mean they're saying, oh, isn't Jane wonderful? But they'll be sitting there and saying, I know a guy who's a piano tuner. And you need a piano tuner if you're going to be able to be playing a concert for your family at the end of the three months and you at the moment don't know how to read music or play a piano but you've got a piano which is done too and there's somebody in the room who knows a piano tuner and there's somebody in the room who has got an old metronome up in their attic which they don't know what to do with and there's somebody in the room who's got who bought a whose who's teenage kids bought a teach yourself to play the piano um, which has been lying around in the attic for the last yeah, 10 years and can lend it to you because you're broke. You know, you haven't got any money, but you've got an idea. And, um, and by, uh, and I've, done, I've done this before. Uh, and it's, a, and it's, it's, you know, on a sort of pedagogic level, it's also, well, this is actually related to, to getting jobs. Um, it's also related to what I call both hard and soft competences. Like, you know, your hard competence is presumably a training as a teacher. Okay. Um, it could be, you know, I'm, I've got a master's in building engineering or whatever. Uh, your soft confidence, however, is the one which is what makes you good at being a teacher or what makes you be good at being a building engineer. And in many countries, particularly Sweden, Sweden in the case, you're not supposed to talk about what you're good at. Um, so that's another element of it. And there's this networking business in this group of 15 odd people, 15 ish people. They're not all, well, they are hopefully all very odd people. Um, there's going to be an awful lot of unknown competence, which maybe even the individuals aren't aware of. But we will be inviting them over time to share this competence, which may be supportive, or it may be I can tune pianos, or it may be <sighs> I had an experience like that myself. Um, and going back to what you were saying, doing it actually in real time, this is, this is not a teaching program, this is a learning program, there's a big difference. I, 20 years ago, one of the guys on this, this um, uh, the, 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 the course that scared me, um, one of the guys said at the end of a three hour session on a Friday afternoon, he said, Mike, this is wonderful, this is exactly what I need for my work group. He said, the problem is, on Monday morning, I'll be back there, same grey walls, same grey office, same grey people who I've been working with for the last 10 years. How do I, how do we, how do we, how do we implement this? And, and at that point, I basically decided I'm going to stop teaching because it doesn't work. You can teach people, you can teach as much as you like, but does it get implemented? And there's the bridge. And, and in some cases, some people can do it overnight. You know, I've heard stories. It's like 
and maybe it works. But very often people change stuff, um, takes a longer time. So, so this is why I think it's important that we do this over a period of three months, because this, this does, does give time for um, sustainable change mm. to at least begin to take root. Good, okay. Fantastic. So now you know, now, now that, thank you for listening. Do, have you recorded this? Yeah.